Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Reimagining the Child Regulation System to Better Support Families. Here, we're going to talk about prevention, um, preventive legal advocacy programs uh, in New Jersey and referencing one from Iowa as well. My name is Jay Roger Raman, and I supervise the Family Representation Project at Legal Services of New Jersey. And I'm thrilled and excited to have this incredible panel joining me from New Jersey. Uh, first, we have David Tang. Um, he's from Our Children in Court. He's going to be speaking about his support and children's in court support of prevention work in New Jersey. And with me, I also have Alexandra Travis and Titus Smith. Alexandra and Titus are our parent and youth experts at Legal Services in New Jersey. Alexandra is our second parent ally in all of New Jersey and has just started with us in this past year. And Titus has been um, part of our reunited youth project forum at Legal Services. He's one of the few voices, not only in New Jersey, but across the country, who has who is speaking out of what it's like to be reunited with his family and the importance of reunification. And he's going to speak about his experience in the child welfare uh, foster care system and the importance of prevention. Okay, and I just wanted to note that we did have Allison Mitchell, who's a social worker from Iowa, but due to personal experiences, personal issues, she's not joining us today, but she was a large part of our planning. And so her information and input is a part of our PowerPoint and part of our presentation. Okay, so I'm actually um, going to first have us look at our polls here, and I believe it should be visible, and I apologize if it's not. Um, oh, it's already been answered. Is that correct? I think it looks like um, right now, um, based on the polls, if this is correct, um, is that 50% pre-petition program in your jurisdiction and 50% is a start one. Um, okay. All right. So I take that back. It's just been re re um fixed here. Okay, so 11, uh, it's going up, so hold on. And I pause. So I think this is, is this the final results, Lewis? Or should I just wait? Oh, no, I'm waiting. Take over electronics. Yes, that's right. There's a delay, which doesn't help me. <laughs> it caused my own delay. All right, that's good. Yes. So we'll just wait a second. So I'll let the poll um, populate and have a sense of who our um, audience is today. Okay. So what our hope is today is to go over the nuts and bolts of a prevention program. So I want you to take away how to actually develop a program and what it looks like and what is preventive legal advocacy. And we're going to specifically talk about what's happening in New Jersey and also hear why it's valuable and relevant, not only in pre-petition uh, civil litigation, but post-petition. So we hope for you to also understand, even if you're not doing this work, you need to understand what prevention work looks like in order to better inform the current child welfare system, either in litigation with your colleagues, with CIP is that it's still important to understand why keeping families uni united and safely together is critical, right? And so just to step back, why are we even talking about prevention and why is this connected to poverty? So as we know, poverty and neighborhood disadvantage are the most consistent and strongest predictors of CPS involvement. And these are things that Marty, if you just heard the plenary, and as defense attorneys doing this work, this is not a surprise, right? In the last few years, we've seen a change with Family First, the direction of the Children's Bureau, incredible national legislations, informational memorandas, improvements maybe in your jurisdiction about language, about how families get involved in the system is based on neglect. And then when we really challenge ourselves, we think about neglect and it's actually poverty, right? It's not gross negligence. These are not children being hurt physically, sexually, or left unintended. All these things that um, are depicted in the media or what individuals may believe the child welfare system is looking to do or solve, right? We know it goes back to lack of housing, lack of um, unemployment, welfare benefits, education issues. 
So why are we taking children away from these families? And so we're looking to actually create a solution and start from why are families involved in the child welfare system? And we also know that these are our families that are impoverished, but also black and brown communities. We know across the state and across jurisdictions that it's more likely if you're black and brown, you're going to be involved in the child welfare system. So we're hoping to offer real solutions today and understanding it through a prevention lens. Okay. So, I mean, just so you know, um, and have this information available to you, we know that there is a foster care problem. Um, there is a huge number of children in foster care, as you can see, close to half a million. Um, and then you can see underneath just the, um, the issues of poverty based on being black and brown and white versus each other. Uh, disproportionality and disparities within the system. So just so you have this information, if this comes into play of like, what's the big deal? We know there's a huge representation of black and brown families nationally in the foster care system. Okay. So just to note again, while black children comprise only 13.9% of the total child population, they represent 23% of the population entering foster care. And um, unlike white children, white children represent 66.7% of the total child population in the United States, yet they only make up 44% of the foster care system. So we can clearly see there's an overrepresentation of black children in the foster care system. So I also wanted to know in the last our states that have improved, including New Jersey, where there has been a decrease of children in foster care, um, and we can link it to some of the prevention and family prevention stabilization projects in New Jersey. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so these are the states that we've just identified. Great if you recognize your state um, that's involved uh, in the decrease of foster care. And of course, we also want to identify the increase of children in foster care. So I'm sorry for these states here, but there's been an increase in placement in foster care um, since 2014, 2018. This is the most recent available data on APCARS. Okay, again, just giving you information and data here so you can see what's occurring in the foster care system. These are other state comparisons, um, which states are doing better than others. As you can see here, New Jersey's um, slightly better than these states. Okay, so now that we know that we have a foster care problem, not a surprise to this group, of course, um, and we also know that there is a disparity and disproportionality problem with oral representation of black and brown children. And as defense attorneys and uh, fighters for children here in this group, um, you still may get, so what? What's the big deal if children are being removed? Um, and here, just again, to stress that there's trauma, right? There's trauma caused by parent uh, separation, parent-child separation. And I think this is um, where we all feel closely connected to. If we knew, um, and I can just briefly read this, as the research on harm inflicted by separating children from their parents is so you ambiguous that the Harvard professor of pediatrics, Dr. Charles Nelson, told the Washington Post, if people paid attention at all to the science, they would never do this. Um, this being separating children from their parents. Okay, uh, just again, for your information, we know that it's a known trauma. Um, and what type of trauma, just to be concrete, we know that children have experienced intrusive thoughts, nightmares, self-destructive thoughts, plans or actions, and PTSD. Um, this is severely damaging to children to be separated from their parents and families. Okay. And then we look to why are we removing? It's poverty and child welfare. Like we said, 
In 2018, the most identified cause or code for child welfare removals or separations was identified as neglect, 67, 62%. And then just again, to reiterate how black African American children comprise 14% of the child population, but over 20 and 25% of children in poverty. Um, so we see the connection between racism in the system and poverty. Okay, um, we have over the years, we can see that there's been 3 million reports each year. Um, noted again, the majority of these are identified as neglect. Um, another stat that I found really compelling is 50% of black children will be subject to an investigation and 83% of all reports are unsubstantiated. Um, so this is a broken system, right? We're seeing that we're not only hurting our families, we're hurting specific families of a certain income and a certain background. Okay. Before I get into the history of race and poverty and bias, I just wanted to take a moment to actually bring Alexandra in, who's our new parent ally, to bring some reality um, and context to what it means to be involved in the system. And so I'll let Alexandra speak now. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Alexandra Travis. I work as a parent ally with LSNJ, and I would like to share with you today my story. Um, I have it written here. It's a little bit easier for me to read it. So um, I appreciate your time and listening. And here we go. While I may not reflect the common parent that Jay represents, the misconception that a certain race, poverty, or addiction problem must mean you are a bad or incapable parent is still prevalent. I have seen firsthand how the system affects black and brown communities and neighborhoods simply because of race and poverty. I know that black mothers face the biggest barriers in the system, and I am here to help all parents, families, and children in the system to avoid what I went through. The removal rate of children is devastatingly high, most of these being completely preventable, and I am here to share with you some of my story in hopes to bring awareness of how pre-prevention work could have impacted my children's future and the well-being of our entire family. The removal of my children has caused long-lasting, deep-seated fear, abandonment, and trauma issues with my eldest children and almost destroyed our family. I have two DCPMP cases, the first tragically ending in the removal and ultimate adoption of my two eldest children to strangers, and the second a triumphant and rare reunification. In 2013, I found myself in the grips of alcoholism, something that runs in my family that I hoped I would never have affect me. Needless to say, it did. Even though I had a loving, supportive spouse and two beautiful children at home, it happened fast and I found myself arrested and incarcerated. Being ignorant to the disease itself and not having any support, a case was opened upon me with DCPMP. It was immediately destructive. We had no idea how to handle a DCPMP case, ultimately signing a safety plan and having violated it, causing more devastation to our case and the ultimate removal of our children. I felt forced to admit to child abuse and neglect, even though I had never harmed my children. They were never starved. They were always taken the best care of, the best schools, healthy and loved beyond measure. I was labeled and deemed a child abuser and unfit parent, something that will stay on my record and name forever. I was forced out of our family home and into homelessness. All the while, my unfailing husband was complying with every task and trying to hold the family together, his only fault being married to me. In the meantime, because our children were removed, we lost our TANF, causing us to lose our home. With no help, support, or resources provided, and eventually seeing myself as the problem, I fled out of state, and when we reached our ASFA, which is that horrible time frame they give you to prove you are the perfect parent before they take your children away forever, my husband was seen as incapable of parenting his children by himself, and because of his job and no childcare and that we lost our housing, our children were adopted out to total strangers. After everything that happened and the soul aching pain I endured after having my children taken from me, I attempted suicide. I coded eight times and lost oxygen to my brain and ended up in a coma for three and a half weeks, even having to learn how to walk and eat normally again. By the grace of God, I pulled through and tried to make some sense of my life and marriage moving forward. We ended up pregnant with a new baby a few years later how bittersweet that was, but simply for the fact that we have had prior terminations, the state automatically opened a case and stepped in to take this next child from us. This time I knew what they were ultimately capable of and I wasn't going down without a fight. 
they were not going to take another baby away from me. I found a wonderful woman's and children's residential program, which happened to be in the same county I resided in. And in hindsight, I could have done this previously with my children had I had knowledge where it had been presented to me. Thankfully, this time around, I had a wonderful attorney who was determined to fight as hard as I was. After a lengthy and uphill battle, I got my new baby boy reunified with me, and I was able to keep my next daughter as well. I feel like had I been able to utilize prevention work, had the support of Ellis and Jay, and had the many resources in our community presented and offered to me, the outcome of my termination would have been different, with no removal at all. The work I am doing now as a parent ally would have had a huge impact for me had I had one, and that's why what I'm doing today, being who we needed to the families and children I'm fighting for, could change many futures. I want to end my story with a happy ending many do not get, nor did I foresee I would have. But now I have contact and visits with my older ch children simply because they needed me. The adoptive parents didn't know what else to do or how to help them, and it's because of this we have contact. My eldest daughter is currently receiving extensive psychiatric care because of her separation and abandonment trauma, and my son is recovering from battling with trictiliomania, which is the pulling out of one's own hair due to a stress response to trauma. My daughter is healing and cannot get enough of us and her three full siblings, and my sweet son has a light in his eyes again and his eyebrows and eyelashes and a whole head of hair that has to say something. However, from a legal standpoint, they are still not mine even as much as they wanna come home. Too often, we don't see beyond what we think we know about the child welfare system, and it goes so much deeper and longer than that. Today, as a supported, empowered woman, I am able to be fully present and my best self for all of my children and in my work as a parent ally. With pre-prevention work, we can save many families and maybe mine wouldn't have had the same fate. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Alexandra. And we're gonna hear more from Alexandra. And feel free um, to drop comments and questions um, in the chat and uh, support um, Alexandra and Titus. And I, I usually say this and I apologize. I just wanted um, to note that this is safe space. Um, Alexandra and Titus are sharing personal parts of their story and it's up to them what they wanna share. We work on strategic speech um, presentation and strategies on that. But Alexandra actually said, I really like sharing my story. It empowers her and she's no longer shutting up <laughs> and she wants to share it. Um, and so I said, this is you, this is for you. And I'm so proud of you. Um, and I also it, I have to share, Alexandra just had a baby and she's with us today, still fighting and working on cases um, without missing a beat. And like I said, you're gonna hear more from her. But I just wanted, um, Alexandra wanted to really illustrate as she keeps saying to me as a parent ally, I wish I had prevention. I wish I had someone like me, a parent ally or other parent ally, Aisha. I wish that there was someone that could help me with benefits and housing. I can't believe they made my husband sign a safety plan that made no sense. Um, so the other point of poverty and these issues is of course, racism. And again, you're going to have this PowerPoint available to you, but just wanted to hit on some of these slides. Um, you know, we can talk about racism in the system beginning with uh, colonization and slavery, but I'm just going to start a little bit uh, further down the timeline with the orphan train movement. Um, the link between poverty and the child welfare system began with the orphan train movements in the 1850s. In 1849, 3,000 children were homeless and they were um, shipped out of New York City for employment and other um, projects throughout the country. And it started um, with the Children's Aid Society in New York City and other agencies were created on transporting orphans to different parts of the country. And they were deemed um, when they were starting to be orphaned and taken from poor families in Eastern cities and rural families or poor families in New York and New Jersey, uh, they were deemed to be unfit. And these children were deemed to be unfit as well. Another um, critical moment would be in 1819 with the Civilization Fund Act that started um, the peace policy. And again, this culture of 
sending and taking Native American children and different families from children from their families and being separated. And again, I know this group can read and we'll have this slide, but I wanted you to have this information to connect what historically has happened in the child welfare system to have data and support for the positions that you're taking that there is racism in the child welfare system and it's connected uh, as early as the 1800s. Okay. Uh, another point, of course, is the war on drugs. Um, again, this shipping off and separation of family of unfit families and children for employment and services as I indicated in the last slides, could then continued and started to transmit or translate to um, the war on drugs or other political issues to sort of change policies and laws to support certain positions um, were, you know, having a lasting impact on families in the system, um, reinforcing racism and uh, poverty based policies that did not support families. Okay. And I think we've heard quite a bit about ASPA. I think Alexandra said it best in her presentation as something un, uh, uh, unbelievably unreasonable and in fact, um, destructive in her case and the cases that she's supporting now. Okay, so before we get to prevention work um, and highlighting what we're actually doing in New Jersey, I thought it would be great to hear from Titus um, and just his experience. Um, hi, Titus. I, if you just want to talk about and express um, what it was like to grow up in your town, being a young Black family um, in your town and working, knowing what was going to happen with the division and what you would like to share. Hello, everyone. I work with Jay. I work with LNS, LSMJ um, to make sure that you is heard more often. Um, I remember growing up, my experience was very traumatic. I, um, we were always kind of being threatened to that we would be removed from our home. And that was one of our biggest fears growing up. And I felt like if we did have prevention, we would be in a totally different place mentally and emotionally where we are now, myself included in my family. So. Uh, what I went through growing up in Maplewood, uh, the town was, it was like a dominantly white town and uh, we often felt like we were excluded um, in the community overall. I know I did growing up, I felt like I was um, too different. We were always going through problems. Our environment was um, unfit, it was not safe. We had counselors from the school that were continuously come over to the house to check up on us to make sure if we were in a safe environment and i just felt like it was kind of an invasion of boundaries and our privacy and all of that because none of my friends growing up had to go through that none of my my white friends have to go through that so um that was one one part of my childhood that in retrospect, I see wasn't really normal. And um, that was before we were removed from our homes. We were removed. Me and my family were actually removed. We never thought it could happen. It was always something that might happen in the distant future. But as time went on and as my parents um, got worse with their arguing and their fights, uh, my sister did call the cops and um they had came over that night and they removed all of us from our home my siblings they separated my siblings they separated me and my brother from my siblings and my mother my mother i did not know where my mother was i did not know where my father was we my aunt said she was going to come to get us before that that happened and she didn't show up. So that night was one of the worst nights of my life. And I still remember it very vividly till this day and how emotional and traumatizing it was to go through that experience. Um, my brother, Titus. yeah. No, sir, uh, Titus, I, um, in our conversations, you've always, uh, you've phrased how you had a, a good friend that was going through really similar things 
Um, but she was a person, a white person. I guess. Yeah. I did you want to? Yeah. I, I know that was something that you, you always felt she needed help, but that wasn't what happened. That was to- one example. I actually, growing up, I didn't have a friend who did went through, go through that. But later on, when I was in high school, I had a friend who I found out was white, who was going through situations that I wanted to help her and just kind of tell her that it was going to be okay. And um, she wanted, she actually wanted uh, child welfare. She wanted Dyfus to kind of get involved with her situation and they would not help her for some reason. I didn't know why, but she was white and they, it was actually really hard. She actually never, to this day, they never got involved with her or her situation at home. She was going through a very t- toxic situation at home and they never intervened. But with my situation, they were always on us. They were always trying to intervene, even though we were extremely hostile towards them and we did not want any type of situation that would result in our family getting separated because we felt we didn't need it. So that's just an example of how you could see with a white family, you have a very toxic situation. They do not get involved. And you have a black family who is hostile towards them, who does not want any help or really call for help, yet we are kind of pressured in a way for them to get involved with us. So that's just an example. Titus, I, I, you know, you've said to me too, what stood out for you was um, the difference how they treated your mom mm-hmm. and your foster mother at the end, Tanya, who was um, a, a white woman. Mm-hmm. Did you want to yeah. share about how you saw your mom being treated so differently? Yeah, so, um, yeah, with Tammy, and she helped us out so much. She was um, she she was fighting for us, and she made sure that we actually reunified, that we got in, back home with our mother. But they gave my mother an extremely hard time. They said she had mental issues, all sorts of things. She was fighting for us. They gave her a hard time in court. They gave her a hard time. She had to go through prison. A bunch of different things that I felt she didn't she should not have went through. Um, but they gave her an extremely hard time before they uh, let us get reunified. Tammy really ha- had to fight for us in order for us to reunify. So, yeah. No, that's so powerful. And um, and as I, I feel really lucky that I was a part of your case mm-hmm. and seeing um, what how the system treated your foster mother, who was really incredible, but they really listened to what she said versus what your mom was trying to do, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Thank you, thank you, Titus. Uh, And we'll be going back to you about prevention um, also. So the first part of this presentation is in hopes of um, to supply you with the information and data of why prevention work could map what happened to Titus and Alexandra and why they're so passionate and committed um, to uh, working with legal services and anyone who's listening on on keeping families together to really prevent what they went through. Um, As we know, poverty is not abuse or neglect. Um, it's defined often in most jurisdictions as not being abuse and neglect, and there's exceptions and frameworks for that. Um, as as we did identify throughout this presentation, that's just not true. Poverty is usually the trigger for removal and separations. Okay, so why is prevention work the solution, and why do we feel like it's um, part of the anti-racist um, uh, system um, of something that we could do, being more anti-poverty, anti-racist, anti-caste. Um, so our program at Legal Services of New Jersey started in 2018. Um, we The agency is over 50 years old, and there's always been a relationship with the division on receiving referrals or reaching out to them on saying, hey, we have a family that we're working with um, that 
is concerned that their children are about to be removed. And it's about eviction. It's about losing their benefits. It's domestic violence. Um, it's mental health. But it's not a safety concern. The children are doing really well. And they are feeling threatened. They are feeling like their children are about to be removed for a civil legal issue. OK. And so we would call the agency and say, this is what's happening. You should not be threatening removal or separation. In fact, we can work with this family, provide civil legal assistance and keep this family whole and out of your range, right? And throughout the years it worked and we had um, throughout different administrations, we've grown into a positive relationship. What changed in 2018, it was a similar call to the current uh, administration where we had to be evicted. And the assistant commissioner said, hey, we actually get tons of these cases. Um, we have a lot of eviction cases. We have a lot of welfare issues. Can we refer all of them? And so within, um, I'll, we'll never forget, it was on a Wednesday. She sent out a blast email to all 21 counties, all the area directors saying, if you have a civil legal issue related to poverty, especially housing, welfare benefits, domestic violence, please email Jay. Um, and within three days, by Friday, we had 30 referrals um, from one county. And so we were in, we were in it, and we were excited, scared, but excited. Um, so what did we do? What did that mean? Um, so immediately, it was trying to identify the clients, provide them with legal assistance and advocate. Um, the parts of our process is we would get an email from the agency and then call that client within 24 hours, do an intake, make sure there's no conflict. And then we would have another attorney or advocate who specializes in that civil legal issue like housing, benefits, unemployment, education assigned to that family. Uh, the trick, or I feel that has worked really well in our case, our, our cases is that we also keep a child welfare attorney assigned to the case. So we have a continuous relationship with the division to make sure they're not separating children from their families. We're holding the agency accountable for their actions to make sure that the children remain safely while we also solve the civil legal issue. Um, so we are now well over 300 cases um, three years later. Uh, just if you, many of you are familiar with um, Vivek Sankran's program in Michigan that we all look to because he started this program several years ago. Um, I believe he had uh, 90 in three years. Um, and so, I mean, we joke about that now, he and I about just the numbers and that I think we are one of the largest programs and the number of referrals from the agency. Um, so this is the type of work we're doing. We're doing civil legal services and imagine whatever it can be, it's changed throughout the years, but it's typically housing, housing related, unsafe housing, um, you know, a, a loss of voucher uh, benefits, I said domestic violence, custody, unemployment, health issues. During COVID, there's been an increase in ed issues. All those Wi-Fi, ed, truancy issues have come up. Unemployment, health care has come up. Um, and these are, and, uh, you know, tax issues have come up. Um, we'll take every referral and we want to make sure that we're assisting. It doesn't mean we are, are always successful, but I'm happy to report out of every referral um, sent to us by the division, we've prevent, prevented a separation or removal. Um, and because we're solving their concern, I think now doing this prevention work and in my experience doing post-petition work um, as defense attorneys, and I know this group is well aware of this, I think you get these large complaints day one and you cannot believe um, that you know, that there's, that this was a poverty issue, right? They will mention drugs, they'll talk about physical abuse, they'll talk about mental health. Um, and there might be one paragraph of like loss of housing or loss of benefits or unable to stabilize their home. Doing this prevention work, I know that the trigger has been poverty um, because many of our clients are struggling with their lives. Lives are complex. There's a lot of complexity, complications. But until the agency is faced with that child being homeless, living on the streets, they're not removing. Um, and now I have well over 300 cases to point to examples where they're not removing if we can give them civil legal assistance to resolve that issue. Now, is every 
a case a win in the sense of um, that there's a invalid eviction or that the individual does not have to pay rent? Absolutely not. But what we're doing, we're negotiating, we're stabilizing the system, we're asking the agency to provide supports and time. Um, and that has been incredibly helpful for our other legal services attorneys. All of a sudden they have access to resources from the division. They have like now a new avenue to support these families throughout these cases. Okay, so I briefly just described, these are just slides um, that we work with. We are multidisciplinary. We have parent allies like Alexandra and Aisha. We have social workers. Um, we have interpreters. Um, it is it is a well-oiled machine. It is incredible. Um, and I, I'm about to have David kind of speak to why he's, um, and from his position and watching from kind of outside in, why we're being supported. I just want to note though, if you are interested in doing this work or looking to do this, I don't want you to think that you need a multidisciplinary um, program and you need a complete holistic program to actually start doing this work. So I just want to ensure you that everyone can do this. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but I will let David kind of speak to why he thinks this is his, this work is important from his perspective. David? Thanks, Jim. And, uh... Thank you for inviting the judiciary to participate in the, this important conversation. Uh, the goal for all of us in the system is to help keep families and children together. I'm David Tang. I work in the Family Practice Division at the New Jersey Administrative Office of the Courts. So I can speak from my perspective as a court uh, employee and administrator. So the judiciary is committed to ensuring access and fairness for everyone. We have a racial uh, equity action plan uh, that can be found on our website. Chief Justice Stuart Rabner and um, our administrative director, uh, Judge Grant, um, have uh, implemented th this action plan and um, we continue to move forward with uh, ensuring uh, equity and fairness for all the people that appear in the courts. So that commitment, of course, includes racial justice. In New Jersey over the years, We've been reviewing our child welfare data to identify disproportionality and disparities. We know that black children are placed at higher rates than white children in New Jersey. Uh, the data bears that out. Um, we know that black children stay in the child welfare system longer than white children. So this data-centric approach that we've taken, uh, as well as the Department of Children and Families, which is New Jersey's child welfare agency, has helped to reduce the disparities in our state. So the information um, that we see in um, the Rutgers um, data hub shows us that placement rates over the last nine years uh, have gone down. So beginning in 2013, uh, black children were placed at eight times the rate of white children. That rate has reduced to two, uh, about two and a half times um, in 2020, but there's still work to be done. We know that disproportionality exit rates have improved slightly, but still remain relatively flat. So in 2013, 44% of black children exited um, care, while 29% of white children uh, exited care. In 2020, 42% of black children exited care uh, and 33% uh, exited care uh, in terms of the white children. So there's still work for us to be done. So let's connect some of these data findings uh, with some of our work in the judiciary. One of my primary responsibilities is to manage the court improvement program, uh, otherwise known as CIP for the New Jersey judiciary. The CIP receives federal funds that can be used to improve outcomes for children and families involved in the child welfare system. CIPs across the country are required to promote continuous quality improvement for hearings, legal representation, and collaboration with our child welfare agencies. So um, we've included in New Jersey in our strategic plan, ongoing training on racism, race issues. We've dedicated positions on reviewing race data. And through the CIP, we also work with stakeholders to develop projects to help our families. Although CIP's main mission is addressing child welfare cases, uh, we're in this workshop today to talk about uh, some of the work that Ellis and Jay has done, as well as other um, uh, as well as other agencies 
to assist in preventing removals and placements. So the federal government has authorized all CIPs to direct funds to help families avoid involvement in the child welfare system. In New Jersey, uh, we've allocated federal funds to support pre-petition work to prevent placements. Jay's described some of the things that uh, her group has done. Um, LSNJ applied for and received CIP funding to provide legal representation to families so that they will not be separated. We expect the data to show us that the upfront legal work that Jay's described will result in fewer family separations. This is also important because a disproportionate number of those families represented by LSNJ are black or brown, as we've discussed. So although a number of the children um, entering placement has dropped in New Jersey, uh, 5,500 in 2013 to a, a low of 1,664 in 2020, pre-petition projects such as LSNJs can help reduce that number even more. Uh, we know that there are a number of families who are separated due to neglect, which is a reason um, that's indicated uh, under the uh, the federal um, under the federal, I guess, categories uh, for removals, and a complaint would be filed for that reason. Some of those neglect filings could have been uh, related to housing, welfare benefits, or any, any other number of non-abuse issues that Jay has mentioned. If there were legal representation on those matters, those families could have been uh, kept together. If that upstream work could be done, those child welfare complaints may never have been filed or necessary. So if you're interested in applying for CIP funds in your state, I recommend that your request explain the issue that you're trying to address as Jay has uh, so eloquently articulated and how the pre-petition work will address that problem. I would also suggest that you include how you'll measure your success. Data is critical in determining whether any intervention is working. So here's my disclaimer from the CIP and the judiciary stand, standpoint. I can only speak for New Jersey experience. Every state's CIP is independent and has its own priorities based on the state's needs. However, if you believe this pre-petition work can help your families and you need resources, I encourage you to reach out to the CIPs in your state to see if there are funds available. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes to talk about our actual uh, model um, to see if it's helpful and um, and if and pull uh, the rest of the group in to answer questions and talk about um, actual cases that we're working on. And so, and we also have one question. Feel free to have ask questions and. Um, and then continue to be uh, make whatever observations, supportive uh, comments in the chat. So, uh, like I said, we not only receive referrals from the agency, and I often get uh, questions about: Do you have a contract? Do you have a relationship? Um, how did this happen? And we don't. We don't receive any funding from the agency. That's purposeful. Uh, we don't want any conflict, um, and it's clear, uh, clearly said to the caseworker in the agency that. Once you refer the case to us, it's our case. Um, the parent becomes our boss. Our service becomes um, only directed towards that family. And we may never talk to you again, um, but we often do because of what I referenced earlier. Um, the division is involved in this family's life, and we're trying to make sure and ensure that parent um, that we're going to keep their children safely with them and do quality prevention work. And so uh, the question is, what type of cases do you take or get screened out and do they go somewhere else? So again, a benefit to working at legal services that um, does not receive LLC funding. So we don't have some of the limitations funding. I forgot to mention immigration. We do a lot of immigration work as well as to status. Uh, so, and I actually want to make it as easy as possible for anyone to refer a case to us. Um, so we used to even have like a form. We got rid of the form. I'm taking texts. I'll take an email. I don't really care. It's like send it to me with their name, brief information of what the issue is. We're actually tracking that more um, out of interest to see if the division is identifying all the issues or how they identify the issues and then we do our own intake, right? Um, but we want that information, we track that and we make it as easy as possible for them to email. We have a dedicated email, we have a dedicated hotline, 
Um, if they don't email to those places, they can text me. It, it's, we'll get it done. We promise the caseworker within 24 hours, we'll, we'll do that intake, contact that client. Um, and we are tracking the data the way um, David has suggested um, from not only of interest, but um, to make sure that we are supporting families in a real way. It's like I said, we're kind of interested in what the agency sees as concerns and what the family sees as concerns, or if they're really concerns, right? Um, part of it is empowering the family voice and hearing from them. And like I said, I never uh, and throughout all my years, I felt that there has been a reason for separation. They're even, they're just struggling. They're living. Um, and so they really want a good attorney who's going to fight for them. And that's really what we're providing. It's like, oh, I wish someone could look over this lease. I don't know if I owe this much in non-payment arrears, right? Um, I have a credit charge that if I could expunge, I can get this new apartment. Um, I wish I could call an attorney. That's what we're doing. And I'm not exaggerating or you know, trying to describe things that we're not seeing. Um, these have been the issues uh, that and so going back to the numbers, um, when we got 30 cases within three days, and at that point, it was just me and my colleague, we were still able to handle the 30 cases um, a lot of them by ourselves, and I'm not a housing attorney, but a lot of it was negotiating with the landlord's attorney. I was negotiating um, with other uh, entities to try to work it out and solve it. And as we know, right, from what we just talked about, um, from, I'm hearing from Titus and Alexandra, these families are exploited, they're marginalized. So their child welfare poverty issues extend to every part of their lives. So I can't even tell you some of the eviction arrears would be like $20,000, but they're in subsidized housing. So they actually owed like $900. This happened time and time again. They would lose their section eight or their voucher because they failed to submit documents. Like they didn't have a scanner, they couldn't print things out. So we would write a letter print out the documents they need, and that would resolve the voucher. This is a common case issue. Um, I wanted to actually have Alexandra get pulled in. She's working with a client, Ms. LC, and kind of describe the work that she's been recently doing and supporting this client. Alexandra? Hi, yes. So I'm working with a client who's fighting for custody of her kin, where housing is the issue that she's facing. And there's a lot of barriers because she doesn't yet have the children, but it's necessary that she acquire adequate larger housing. Unfortunately, there are many housing assistance programs, but she cannot currently claim the children to receive them because they're still in foster care. And sadly, um, I'd like to note that they're separated from each other. So it's kind of like a catch-22. Um, there are so many resources that are available out there. However, they're not avidly presented. And it's taking parent ally work and LSNJ to navigate these avenues to help her succeed and hope to prevent losing more children to the system. Alexandra, can you describe um, what you've seen in the actual housing search and some of the things that you've had to actually do for her uh, or with her um, to navigate the system? So it's hard when you reach out to like community resources because they're more adapt to helping women with children Again, the barrier there is she doesn't yet have the children. Um, so that's a roadblock. And then also, you know, if she does have a, a voucher of some sort of like a down payment um, assistance, uh, there's not many people out there that are very open or willing to accepting something like that if they're not aware of what government it's coming from or does this mean this person cannot pay their rent? Uh, does this mean this person is like... You know, they just think all sorts of lowly things when you're coming at them with like a government um, issued assistance. And then also, you know, a lot of the other ones that were presented are through realtors. Realtors are going to be looking at credit. And, you know, when you're just a hardworking woman, you sometimes, you know, you don't have the best credit. So we're out of luck there. It's just barrier after barrier. Um, just kind of looking for the next the next thing to utilize. Alexandra, as you can describe, she's not only um, a support for Miss Elsie, she's like in the weeds. She's calling these places. She's looking up resources. Um, she knows where to go where caseworkers don't know. She knows what it's like to be a parent. Um, and I think some of the things we've talked about, right, Alexandra, where I think even um, one of the first steps when you're connecting with the parent 
is to build trust, right? So we're being referred um, by the agency to reach out to legal services. And um, we've decided that we wanna eliminate any stress to the parent, right? So we don't ask, we actually suggest that the caseworker gives us the information directly and we'll call uh, the client. This is so the parent doesn't feel like this is another burden or another barrier. Um, and within the first few minutes, um, the advocate has to uh, express to the parent that we're not working for the division, we're working for you, this is confidential, this is privilege. Um, and that's actually really hard. And I, I raise this because this came up as a question or related to one of the questions about um, pre-petition advocacy being related to reasonable efforts. And um, so, you know, kind of working back to that, uh, we have to make sure that the client knows that we're your attorney, we have a separate retainer between you and I, um, or for whatever services we're providing. So that's one of the trust issues that comes along with being referred by the agency, um, even if you're a separate attorney. We've gotten really good about expressing that pretty quickly, and it really helps with Alexandra being there as a parent. Um, and I just want to note why it's been critical to have Alexandra and Aisha. They have been my go-to in a lot of this work. They're able to kind of support me in understanding the issues. Cause sometimes I do have parents who are struggling and and they may say to me, I actually just don't want to get an apartment. I'd rather get this apartment um, because I know down the road I can afford this. Um, and so this is um, something that I've learned and Alexander has been really helpful and Aisha has been really helpful in understanding that. Um, some things with the LC case is, as Alexandra pointed out, was her credit. She has a prior eviction. And in New Jersey, in a lot of jurisdictions, you can't um, expunge prior evictions, even if you settle or have it dismissed or come up with a payment plan. And so that's all public and available. But when we're working with them, what we've been able to do with this case, if she finds stable housing, we've gotten the division to agree to provide first month's rent, um, the security deposit, and write a letter. Uh, we just had, it's the struggle is the landlord, which is what we've been trying to work with and what Alexandra's working with. But we were able to get the agency to be supportive of this aunt. And so our hope is that she'll get the children. Um, as to reasonable efforts, uh, so we have actually made clear to the agency that we're not a reasonable effort. Like sending a referral, we're not in your process. We're not going to be like a checkbox for you to say, I sent them to legal services and they failed to call legal services or legal services can solve poverty for them. Um, and I just want to back up and say like this whole premise of supporting families is that um, is that we 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 want to kind of change the narrative here, right? Is that we don't expect this one individual who's been marginalized, who's a single black woman or a single brown woman in the in New Jersey and a highly rich state, you know, there's such uh, financial disparities that she's able to take on the housing poverty issues of the country, of the world, right? Like individually, if, you know, she's able to be able to secure housing, why would we expect that of her? And that's really what's often being said to by to our parents and what our parents convey to us. So it's not, it's, it's constantly pushing back and challenging this narrative and saying we actually should serve and support them and permit them to do what they need to do um, as they see their existence to be and their children are safe. That's like always kind of the pull. Um, and while we always kind of bring the agency and keep them on the hook, so they hear that, that that's what's messaged back. Um, we don't use the safety planning guides that they use. We don't use the same forms. We actually have created our own documents and it's not documents our clients are expected to fill out. We ask, we ask the caseworker to fill it out. We like make sure the burden's on them, going back to reasonable efforts, that we wanna make sure that they feel empowered and the parents feel empowered. Um, Alexander, do you, do you want to add or wanted to bring up, I know we just talked about safety plans, anything you wanted to talk about? I know you had a terrible safety plan in your case, if you wanted to hit on that. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, they draft up these things, the safety plans. They don't really go too much into detail of what they entail, um, more so what would happen if there were to be a violation, um, what the next steps would be. They almost make impossible demands on the safety plans um, with no other outlet. Like, um, for example, mine was, I was coming straight out of incarceration, but I was not allowed into my family home. But that was my only home 
And that's where I lived with my husband and my children. And that's all I've ever known. I didn't have an option of family or couches or going here or friends' houses. That was my home. So um, they didn't offer me any other resources. I mean, now that I know there's like 211, there's all these shelters, you know, there's all these things I know now, um, having gone through this, but I was never offered like, oh, well, you could do this, you could do that. So I found myself in my car in the middle of December on the side of the road. And I hadn't seen my children in 457 days. It was Christmas time and it was only a matter of time before I cracked and I just wanted to go in my house, take a warm shower, sleep in my bed and hug my children. Needless to say, because I made that choice, in turn, my husband violated his safety plan by allowing me there. And also, um, they pretty much came two nights later, if that, and removed the children in the dead of night while my son was hanging an ornament on the Christmas tree, which has been a traumatic scene that has stayed with him ever, ever, ever since. And it has stayed with me and it even plagues me in my nightmares. But, you know, that wasn't disclosed like, hey, if we ever catch you in your house, we're immediately removing your children in this, you know, abrupt and devastating fashion. Um, also, since the, the violation of the safety plan, there was still a whole year that my husband went and completed every single thing they asked him to do, things that even weren't even relevant. Domestic violence classes, parenting classes, uh, random urines, leaving work all the time have to be there within an hour. Um, Catholic charity, psychological evaluation after psychological evaluation, just all these things for the following year, just for the violation of safety plan to be brought up at the end of the, the T, uh, TPR hearing, the termination of parental right okay. hearing. And in the end, uh, that coupled with the other things as far as losing the housing or the TANF, um, that violation of that safety plan was enough to where he was an unfit parent. Um, and he didn't even get custody of, of our children. Um, so it's just like, you, you don't even know what you're signing or why or what it all entails. And I really wish that I had some legal counsel um, at that time to realize what that really, what that really means. Um, thank you, Alex. So well put um, and, and sharing that. And um, I just wanted to ask Titus, um, I know you've, you and I have a lot of conversations and we've brought up um, just the difference, how your mom was treated. And it kind of reminded me what Alexandra was talking about, the difference between your dad and your mom. And this is sort of what we also do in our prevention work because we'll serve the entire family. There's not a conflict and, you know, only if we, if there is an illegal issue, but we think of it as an entire family case. Um, Titus, did you want to hit on that, on the difference between how they treated your dad and your mom? Yeah, so my mother struggled a lot and my father was often looked at as a good guy. Um, my my mother, like I said before, she was, she was uh, they called her crazy. Um, they talked over her. They put her in... Um, um, they put her in a mental mental hospital and they put her in prison and uh, she was missing for two weeks straight. They didn't listen to my mother, but my father, he just came into court whenever he wanted to. And um, he just wasn't really like, he, he wasn't as active as my mother was, but they treated um, my mother very poorly. Thanks. Thanks, Titus. I know. Um, I knew you wanted to stress that. I think often, um, uh, f uh, just how you serve the family and look at each individual. And I knew it's important how much you love your mom, and how in that case it was really housing, lack of housing, and mental health, and yes. how, yeah, that she was just looked down. I mean, uh, and when we talk about prevention work and not entering the system, um, you've mentioned to me it could have been solved with like helping your mom, keeping the house organized or bringing family support. Um, was that ever offered to you? Do you recall like your mom ever getting those supports? I don't recall my mother getting any kind of support, but I do remember counseling. I remember getting counseling. 
um, besides the counseling, they weren't they weren't really empathetic towards my mother at all. Thanks. And that has been something we've raised with our team as Titus hits on um, the concrete issues. Um, you know, when we work with families now, and, and it's sometimes so little as um, getting a housing cleaning service to assist the family, organizing with mom, budget management from their perspective, not being imposed by an agency saying you shouldn't spend your money on this toy or a TV, but you should be saving your money for rent. Like these are sort of the critiques that come out um, in prevention world with the child welfare caseworker. And um, none of the families we serve respond well to that, right? It's judgmental, it's destructive surveillance. Uh, and so it's another way to sort of push back on that narrative. Um, and it's just been incredible because when we have folks like Titus and Alexandra say, look at us, we're really doing well. Like Titus has an incredible musical career in addition to his work with legal services. Alexandra is running an incredible household, um, an incredible cook, um, does so many things. And, you know, they actually take a step back and say, oh, these, you know, these individuals are doing well, which is the value of having a parent ally. Um, and, but it's still what Alexandra and I were just saying is that it's still hard to connect how great their examples are to then seeing the families we serve in the same sort of empathy and the same sort of human light. And that's been the struggle in prevention world, um, but it's been critical. So I just wanna make sure I hit on these questions and then I'll open it up to the group on why, if you're not doing prevention work, why, why this is valuable um, post petition. Um, so let me see, so let me work backwards here. Um, I think we talked about reasonable efforts. So there's a question about issue spotting, um, destabilizing legal problems. Do you train the caseworkers? So we offer um, training. You know, we have done joint trainings. Um, we've actually spoke to more of their leadership and um, advocates in that way, saying, you know, we're available. And what has come up, and we feel pretty strongly about that, is, is that they cannot supply the attorney representation to these families, right? There's an internal conflict. They're always looking to remove and separate. So having um, the AG's office have an attorney would not be helpful representing them on, on any issues. They've, they've also agreed this is an internal conflict. Um, we do think they should have experts in specialization on what's the housing resources that are available, um, which certain jurisdictions are developing. But what we find though, it's still the lens of, separation exists, right? It's still gathering information on the family just in case if we have to remove. And we hear that directly from caseworkers all the time. Caseworkers say, I can't speak to my AG or the attorney representing the agency because they'll turn whatever I'm saying as a reason to remove or separate or build a case against the family versus resolving the legal issue. So that's been the benefit of this. Um, and as we grow this project and why it's continued over the past few years, we produce positive outcomes, right? We've keeping families together. Um, we have not addressed the cost effectiveness. You know, as we know, it's thousands of dollars per child in foster care. And if the division helps with rental arrears and it could be $1,000 for a year staying safely in the same home, right? If it's a few hundred dollars to pay for a filing fee, that's way better besides the moral reason of not separating the children from their families. It's a financial reason. So we've had to raise that uh, cost-effective argument with the agency. So that's been part of our conversation with them. And the caseworkers love us. They really do. They continue to send um, cases. And in New Jersey, which I understand a lot of jurisdictions, there's prevention caseworkers, right? They're not the ones that represent the agency post removal. So they don't have ASPA. They don't have the time restrictions. They don't have the timelines. They don't have the stressors. They don't have an AG trying to um, document these, these factors as reasonable efforts or reasons to have their child removed. It's a completely different culture and environment. And uh, because of our social workers, the social workers speak caseworker and they commit better, they communicate better effectively. Alexandra's um, 
and, you know, and Aisha will speak to the caseworkers and they're much more sympathetic, much more understanding with Alexandra versus with me as an attorney. So we have a dynamic here that again, goes back to family focus, family serving prevention work versus post petition work. Um, and uh, there's a question about retainer. So it depends on the type of work. I mean, if we're actually representing them in these civil legal issues, we do get a retainer with our clients. Sometimes we don't need to. It's really resolved in some negotiation or something more resource uh, concern versus a legal issue or a legal barrier. Um, and like I said, we rather have the referrals come to us and we assess and sort out. We want to make it as easier as, po as easiest as possible for caseworkers to refer to us and us assess what the legal issue is. And it's not just division. We've now opened it up post removal. So we get referrals from judges, children's attorneys, other parents' attorneys um, saying that it's a poverty issue. The, the housing issue is what's remaining for the reunification. And we'll try to jump in and take it, uh, take that legal issue on to sort of resolve that and assist the family. And then we are able to supplement the record and file documents on behalf of the parent. And because of our relationship with the stakeholders, courts are actually really interested in hearing about the civil legal issues. What before this, I think everyone on this call and this panel, and I'll open up to David Alexander and Titus, like you would hear often, um, and David, maybe you might know this personally, like you would hear or see court order saying, order section eight, order housing, right? And I, you know, and caseworkers would come back from there like, I don't know why would the judge order this, right? Like, why is that an issue? Um, David, do you mind speaking on what your sense of judges are, or if you can reflect on what uh, post-petition work looks like, or how people understand prevention work and why it's important in post-petition work from what you can see? So let me start by saying okay. I'm not a judge, so I don't think I can comment on a judge's decision-making process when it comes to those things. Um, but ultimately, you know, the judges always look at the cases um, to determine whether or not it's safe to return the kids home and you know all those other things that are discussed in the child welfare cases. I'm not sure I'm answering the question, Jay, but um, you know, it's- Yeah, I think, I, I mean, it's, so it's one of the things that I credit our CAP and um, the judiciary in New Jersey supporting this work. It doesn't directly, uh, in obvious terms, right, David, it doesn't, um, affect their caseload and the cases right in front of them, right? Um, and so for us to be supported, Ellis and Jay to be supported in hiring attorneys to keep cases out of the court system is pretty incredible, I think. And that sort of connection of, I understand that if we support families in this legal world, we're going to reduce our caseload, we're going to reduce um, the actions before us. And I think that is has been a key. Um, in addition to what I had mentioned before, the financial savings has been key. Um, I know I've become a much better post-petition attorney doing prevention work. Um, so before I didn't, I understood what was available. I knew all the differences between vouchers and welfare, but now I actually know which programs, I know timelines, I know um, I have direct connections with certain caseworkers. Um, that's been incredible. So when I am in post-petition world, I have a way better cross, okay? Like I know what I'm asking. I know what's required. I'm going after you because I know that you could have done more. Um, and I don't think um, judges saw that or understand that as well now that we are pulling these two worlds together because they're so interconnected. Um, and that's just been really critical. Um, and so, I think that is something when you're developing a program and judges are like, that's great, uh, you know, but I really don't care about that case until it comes to my courtroom. Um, you want to sort of bring up prevention language and understand, say, well, judge, if you knew that this was available or this occurred, this may develop into a different way of thinking at those emergency hearings and removal hearings. One thing I just want to point out um, on this point is um is that um, is that judges will often say that when they see a case that's lasted um, several years in prevention world. So they, this family had a division case for two years and then there's a removal. And, um, and this was similar, Titus had 
you know, his family had lengthy history with the division off and on. And that didn't help his mom's case when it came to removal, right? It's all of a sudden her history was damaging. It, it painted, depicted this narrative like she was under the guy, she was under under this um, under concern for the families. But what I've learned is it's been division's actual exhaustion of funding or their own resources and services or frustrations with the family. So I've had caseworkers say, we've done everything. We can't, we're not the housing authority, right? We're not able to keep paying. We can't come up with creative, other creative ways. So they feel that their only option is to remove and separate. However, that's not translated that way to the court system. It has to be imminent, right? It has to be danger. It has to be harm, actual or risk of imminent harm, right? And that's not the case. So what was happening to this family for two years, it was exhaustion by the caseworker, not the family causing more drama or trauma to the family. And that, again, is something I've seen firsthand now, well over 300 cases, and that's a huge issue um, to translate back. So judges understand and know this, um, they feel a lot better. Um, or are much more educated on knowing what's happening pre-petition world and to just empower advocates to kind of explain that because it's just not true. It's not like all of a sudden one day the family got worse and did something really abusive. It's in fact the agency just didn't know how to serve this family longer. And again, that's where you want the civil legal advocacy. Okay, um, I think I've hit every question. So one other question, staff, sorry, I guess I didn't, staff, staff attorneys and social workers. Uh, we have, um, we don't have dedicated social workers. We have six uh, social workers for our office, um, but because these are um, so imminent in the sense of uh, children, keeping children safely with family, we get priority. So our social workers, are automatically signed to every one of these cases if we decide. Um, we talk to Alexandra and Aisha on, on cases to see if it makes sense. And if they want to get involved, we let them lead and working with the family. Um, and then, you know, the feedback, I go to Titus to get feedback on just things, how things are being said. Like, does this make sense if we're developing um, language for the website? Or, you know, is this document make sense? Would this be helpful? Because we have a lot of youth um, parents and um, and just try to see if this is helpful and for their you know older children. So we'll get feedback from our youth forum, and I know I know Titus and Alexandra have an interest on now talking about ASPA, and this is where we let them kind of lead the way and guide us again in our uh, in our services to the family. So I bring them in for feedback um, often to hear like what are your thoughts on this? Does this make sense? Um, so I have their input. So when I'm talking to families. I'm guided by um, families that understand the system and youth who understand the system. Um, so our budget, we, outside of just the recent CIP funding, and we do have parent ally um, funding, we don't have any other grants. This has just been legal services uh, budget that we get through the state, um, state budget, and um, that's about it. Again, going back to the uh, jump in mentality. Like I said, I had 30 cases within two days and it was just the two of us. Um, so much can be done from your uh, computer at home or in your office, wherever you may be um, soon. So I stress that. I can't tell you how much uh, you can do by just making phone calls, negotiating, looking at these eviction complaints, um, looking at whatever the legal issue is, a lot can be resolved um, internally without even going to the courthouse and using resources. And with that said, if you're developing a program, look at your resources, see what attorneys, what the advocates want to do. So I've talked to other organizations and they're really interested in domestic violence. Like that's what they want to do. Um, so they have one attorney who's pro bono or a private firm who's willing to take domestic violence. That's how you start your program. Pick the issue that you're most interested in or your staff interested in. And if it's just you and your sole practitioner, we've seen a lot of private law firms have taken on some of our bigger issues. They want to do pro bono work. We've worked with the bar. We've worked with other community providers who've been interested. So if there's a conflict or we can't do it immediately, we have expanded outside of legal services because there's an interest not ever doing child welfare cases. No one wants to do what we're doing uh, post-petition, um, but everyone's really interested in like 
you know, the one day court hearing or two days in court or calling um, an administrative law judge to resolve a mistake, um, filling out unemployment documents, explaining unemployment benefits, um, all the CARES Act provisions that we've been able to outsource. And you'll be surprised how interested um, advocates like doing that. Um, so I just suggest, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you more about that if you work on wherever you are on the program of these issues. Um, so we just have a couple more minutes left and I just wanted to let the rest of the panel, if they have any closing remarks, um, and I'll start with Titus, if you have any thoughts or if you wanna say anything about prevention or just your perspective, Titus, um, from a youth perspective. No, my perspective on prevention. Uh, whatever you want to say closes out, Titus, if there's any last uh, thoughts. Um, if not, you don't have to say anything either. Whatever you want to say. Um, not anything's coming to mind right now. Perfect. That's fine. Thanks. I love that Titus is always honest, and I always want to make sure you have a chance to speak, but that's fine. Thank you. Thank I love you. it. Um, Alexandra, any other so I just think in looking back, um, seeing all the places that prevention work could have been put in when before my my kids were removed, there were so many um, different things that could have been offered to us, um, different resources like you spoke about, just some just compassion, empathy, um, just trying to see like how can we help this family because we were good people, you know, we loved our children, we never harmed them. You know, we just were struggling here and there. Uh, we just needed a little help. Uh, it would have gone a long way. And as you can see now, you know, my older children are very damaged um, from the removal. And, um, you know, we, we've just got to stop that because it does go so much further than, oh, let's just remove, let's just remove. Do you check on these kids in five years and see how they're doing? You know, um, you would know that they're suffering and that they're traumatized and that there's nightmares and that there's psychological issues and pulling out their own hair. And this is all because they've been separated from their parents. And as I can attest to a little bit of recovery and uh, somebody lending a hand out to me and a hug and healing, this is what that looks like. And I have had the most beautiful life the past few years, uh, just fighting to get back everything I lost and fighting to find and help my children and fighting this good cause and just being a upstanding human being and a beautiful woman inside and out. And um, this could have been me many years ago without suffering. So my hopes are just to uh, help other people not go through what we did and be who we needed for them so that hopefully children will not have to be taken away. And if it's something as simple as a housing resource or transportation, or just re-encouragement or anything pointing in the right direction could save the whole case, the whole family. That's just what I hope to to do and bring light to. I, I, I don't think we could follow. Um, David, I don't mean to cut you off, but if you have nothing to add, I think we're out of time, if that's okay. No, thank you again, Jay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care.